Today, we're talking about the Pilliga Forest. It's the largest intact patch of forest remaining west of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales, and it covers about half a million hectares. It's part of the traditional lands of the Gamilaroi people, and it grows on the sandy plains north of Coonabarabran. The forest supports a huge diversity of eucalypts mixed with cypress pine and bull oak, as well as more open shrubby areas of Melaleuca. In 2016, AWC entered into a partnership with the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service to establish a major reintroduction project in the Pilliga. The objective is to return six locally extinct mammal species to the area within a specially constructed feral predator-free area of 5,800 hectares. And to tell us all about how the project is going, I'm joined today by Dr. Vicky Stokes, who's Senior Wildlife Ecologist in the Pilliga. Vicky, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joey. Great to be here and thanks for everyone who's listening in. I'd love to start by getting you to paint us a picture of what it's like in the Pilliga Forest. What's that landscape like as you're driving through it and walking through it? Yeah, so it's quite a unique landscape. When I started working in the Pilliga just over two years ago, I was quite amazed at how different it sort of almost looked like a little bit like an alien landscape to me compared to the to the forests and woodlands I'd worked in previously but yeah it's very dominated by cypress pine as you mentioned um with a whole other mixture of other eucalypts sign barks and pillar box and other box species as well as alacasurina um which we refer to as bull oak so um and very different um yeah the cypress pine does make it very different if you've never been in that landscape before so um it's quite a different tree species to all our eucalypts um and yeah there's very the the forest or woodland as people refer to it is yeah different structures you know some in some places it's very woodlandy looking in other parts it's more forest with a bit more sort of understory and shrub cover and we also have shrubland habitats mixed in amongst the forest and woodland, which is very low growing shrub, um, which is often bordered by sort of more mallee mallee type eucalypts. Um, yeah, and sort of patchily distributed throughout the landscape. And it's sort of on that interesting overlap where you get, you know, species that are more common on the east coast at the western edge of their range. And then some of those more inland sort of, um, you know, arid adapted species on the eastern edge of their range. So it's quite diverse for things like birds, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So we do get a mix of of birds. Yeah. As you say that, you know, um, yeah, it's from stuff that is more sort of in semi-arid um, and then, yeah, some species that are actually um, on both sides of the Great Dividing Range. Yeah. Mm. Great. I'm sure some people have been out there bird watching. Um, it's it's a hot spot for that kind of thing. Now, AWC's project is largely revolving around a, a, a project to restore some of the locally extinct mammal species to the Pilliga Forest. So just how many species are missing from this landscape? What what sorts of species are missing? And what have we what have we done to try and rectify that? Mm. Yeah, so unfortunately, the Pilliga, like many places of Australia, does not have a very good um, history of, of we have lost quite a lot of species, um, particularly mammal species within that um, critical weight range between sort of about 35 grams up to five kilograms. Um, and yeah, Pilliga is not immune from that. So we have lost quite a lot of species. Um, some of the species that we have lost that we are looking, um, that we have reintroduced are things like the greater bilby, um, brush-tailed betong, um, the um, western barred bandicoot, also known as shark bay bandicoot, um, the western quoll or chudich, um, and bridal nail tail wallabies. So yeah, um, and we've lost quite a lot of rodent species from the landscape. There were previously in historical records, um, between historical records and fossil records, estimated at 11 species of, of native rodent in the Pilliga, and we only have one existing native rodent, the Pilliga mouse um, in the Pilliga. So there's been a considerable loss of those really small, small mammals. And we are reintroducing yeah. that we've re recently reintroduced the plains mouse which is one of those species great i'd love to talk a bit more about the plains mouse because i don't think most of us are very familiar with the range of 
native rodents that Australia is home to. Um, but there's a, a huge diversity of these, these species. Tell us a little bit about the plains mouse. What makes it different from other native Australian rodents? Yeah, so the plains mouse is, yeah, one of, of our unique rodents. It's actually um, in the Pseudomys genus, and we've got 23 species of Pseudomy um, in Australia. Um, and it is, they are considered what we refer to as old old endemics. So people will, might hear of um, sort of old and new um, Australian endemics in terms of rodents. So, and what that means is that um, they're the ancestors of Pseudomys um, are one of the first, you know, rodents to actually um, move into Australia um, from from Asia um, about five million years ago. So they've actually been in Australia, the ancestors, and then you know different species have evolved from that common ancestor to occupy lots of different habitats and parts of Australia. And it's something that's you know, the rodents don't really receive much attention, unfortunately, in Australia, but they're absolutely beautiful animals. And the um, interesting thing about the plains mice um, is that it is one of the rodents in Australia that, that still lives in very arid environments. Um, and it is one of our larger um, larger um, pseudomies. Um, it's often referred to as plains rat because it really is in between that size of a of a mouse and a rat, so. We'll go with mouse. Um, yeah. <laughs> for their sake. Um, yeah. So one of the larger native rodents, and you were saying it's got quite an interesting distribution, like it's found in parts of the Simpson Desert and east of Lake Eyre in sort of Gibba country, so very, very arid, stony plains. But yes. also with a historical range right up to just west of the Great Divide, including the Pilliga. Mm -hmm. um, but we know it's missing from a huge chunk of that historical distribution. So it's one of those mammals that has contracted. And so to re-establish a population of small mammals like this in the Pilliga, what sort of steps are involved? Yeah, so as you said, it has, it's, we're sort of estimating that it has contracted by about 50 to 90% of its range. It used to occur from way over on the western side of the Nullarbor and as you said, right up into um, the Pilliga. So um, Gould did describe the species within the Pilliga. Um, yeah, so we're pretty confident that it used to be there as well as from fossil records. Um, but yeah, one of the challenges with um, with re-establishing and reintroducing small mammals um, is, you know, the smaller the animal, you know, the more um, sort of other threats. Obviously, the, a big threat for all of our reintroduced species are foxes and cats, and, and hence the reason for reintroducing them into fenced areas like the fence, the 5,800 fence that you, you mentioned um, in the Pilliga is to remove that threat um, and allow those, establish, those populations to establish. The smaller you get, um, with rodents, they're on the bottom of the food chain. And so it's not just feral um, predators that are an issue for these species, but a whole suite of native predators. And in the Pilliga, things like barking owls and barn owls, um, you know, plains mice will be a lovely morsel for them, as well as things like goannas and um, snakes. We have quite a few nocturnal snakes and um, the threatened pale-headed snake is one that we do have in the Pilliga forest. So, yeah, we have to, um, when we're reintroducing a species, we do need to really reintroduce a much higher number of animals, um, knowing that the survival, you know, is not going to be as high as some of our large animals. Um, the other challenge with small mammals, which has been, um, which is in the literature and it's something that other um, ecologists and organisations translocating small mammals have found, is that there is a tendency for them to what we call hyperdisperse, which is mean where, where you release them, they'll quickly move away from that area and it makes it very difficult to then monitor and know how successful your translocation has been. So um, as part of reintroduction of plains mice for the Pilliga, we wanted to do a bit of a research trial to look at whether we could lessen that hyperdispersal and as a consequence increase our chance of keeping track of um, the reintroduced population as well as um, increase the survival. So we did a trial where we... Um, what we refer to as soft released our plains mice. So we built constructed little pens. Um, you can see a picture here of the pen. So um, we actually constructed quite sizable comp pens compared to what's been done in the past. So our original pens were 10 meters by 10 meters. Um, 
and we yeah put a, a handful of animals five animals in each pen um with the intent of allowing them to get used to the habitat as you mentioned before where they currently occur is in much more arid landscapes in the Piliga, very much associated with yeah that stony gibber country um and associated with cracking clay plant plains sorry where they get underground um so yeah, a key thing for us was that we we knew that they had to get underground um, because they burrow underground and for shelter during the day. Um, and that's where they also have their nests and raise their young. So it was very critical to make sure um, that we were giving them the time to get underground. So we did two, I suppose we adopted two strategies with that. One was putting some in pens, a subset in pens to contain them and give them the chance to do that and Part of the soft release is we provide food and water um, because we are constraining them into where they can move. And the other approach that we took is that all of our release sites for all of our plains mice were associated with suitable soil types and sandy soils. And we also selected areas where there are already existing holes. So existing extensive um, bilby diggings, okay. bil old bilby burrows, old holes of goannas and things like that, that we were hoping that the plains mice could could get into once we release them. Right. So a lot of consideration about the um, you know location of those release sites as well as that intervention of soft release pens. So it's, it's quite an intensive setup for this release of a, a small mammal like the plains mouse. And I understand there was still some unexpected predation from another small mammal, a, a native species in this case, inside the feral free fenced area. What was the surprising predator of plains mouse that uh, posed a challenge to this reintroduction? Yeah, so as you say, it was very surprising. Um, it, it has not been documented before and we were were not expecting it at all. But um, yellow-footed antichinus, which is a desiurid, um, um, which are we know can be, you know, feisty little creatures and, you know, they are predators. So they largely eat invertebrates and and maybe take the odd small reptile and um, probably very rarely take other small mammals. But, um, yeah, it was unfortunately our plains mice didn't get underground. They were wandering into logs where antichinus were, had their dens um, and encountering them out in the open as well. Um, tending to shelter, sort of quite exposed, sheltering under grass and, and often in the open. Um, so they were quite exposed. They weren't doing what they really needed to do um, and obviously quite disoriented as well um, in a new landscape. They were animals that most of them had, they were from a captive breeding program. So we we know that, you know, there can be a sort of extra level of, I suppose, naivety with captive bred animals. So um, but yeah, the yellow-footed antichinus was very unexpected. So they're half the size. They were actually half the size of our plains mice, all the plains mice that were released. And um, yeah, we were. It was quite a distressing experience tracking our animals that were hard released. So they were released to the same habitat as where our pens were, but outside the pens. Um, it was quite a confronting experience for our ecologists to be tracking and finding these animals that were half eaten by mm. yeah yellow yellow footed antichinus. So yeah, so thank goodness for the soft release pens, which turned out to be a, a critical part of making the reintroduction a success. You mentioned that you're tracking some of these animals. Can you tell us about the the process of monitoring that goes on after the release, and how's the population doing now? Yeah, so with all of our reintroduced species, uh, we have success criteria. We have short, medium and long-term success criteria. And short-term success criteria is all about survival um, and animals maintaining body condition and body weight, which gives us an indication that they, you know, that they're finding sufficient food and, you know, adjusting to the new environment. So, um, yeah, so with all of our species, we do... Um, um, track. We put little transmitters, VHF transmitters, um, attached to the animal. Um, and in the case of the plains mice, they're just attached as little collars around their neck. Um, and that enables us to track their movements and also find where they're sheltering during the day. So we knew, you know, we could find the burrows of animals in our pens. We could find 
where the animals were sheltering and then obviously find animals that had been predated as well and retrieve the collar and, and bodies um, as part of that process. So, um, yeah, it's a very critical part of, of um, monitoring the reintroduction and determining the initial success of it. Um, and, yeah, as I mentioned, with the plains mouse, it was, it was, yeah, it was not what we expected and, unfortunately, we had very low survival of our animals that were released by a hard release, but our soft release animals, we had very high survival. We had 70% of them survive. The ones that didn't survive were ones that actually did get out of the pen um, on their first night. They, they're they actually quite little jumpers. They can jump really high. So um, we've had to sort of add some extra things to our pens to prevent them from getting, getting out. So, um, but yeah, it's a very critical part as well as the other critical part of monitoring initially is um, monitoring their body condition and their weight. Um, so we do trap animals within a couple of months of release um, so in terms of the plains mice, we are still managing them in soft release pens um, because we want to genetically supplement, hopefully in the next couple of months, genetically supplement with some additional individuals. We have we have actually tested them being released outside the pen with a small number of animals and a small pen, um, and those animals all survived. Um, they had We know they had encounters with black rats and antichinus because um, black rats were also another predator when we released them, not as much as the yellow-footed antichinus, but some individuals were taken by, by black rats. So um, we, we're feeling comfortable now that the animals uh, have adapted, they've got their burrows, they, they're doing an amazing amount of work on their burrow systems. It's been quite a pleasure to watch in the pens um, what they do with their burrows. They're, they're quite clever. They move their entrances quite regularly, which is what we want to see in terms of their ability to, to survive in this landscape with a whole suite of native predators. So, um, and yeah, they, we can actually see with some of the older burrows um, the extent to which the tunnels extend because they pop little air holes up or like once it's a certain distance from the actual borough entrance they'll pop little air holes up that just look like a little round sort of spider hole that goes down into the tunnel so um yeah we're sort of yep learning lots about them and and keeping a close eye on them still in the pens and hopefully look to opening up we're pretty confident that we'll be able to open it up uh, but we just want to get some genetic supplementation with some new individuals um, from arid south australia from wild populations to add great that's it's such an intensive period of work to help these populations become established but um great to hear that the plains mice are now doing well in the pilliga within those soft release pens and and hopefully beyond um, before too long there have been another couple of species reintroduced since we had our last update from the Pilliga. Could you tell us about this one? It's another one that's um, declined a lot across Australia, but has succeeded in these fenced safe havens. This is the beautiful brush-tailed betong. Um, and we sourced brush-tailed betongs all the way from Western Australia. Um, so um, it was a big journey for them, but I was really excited about getting brush-tail betong into the Pilliga because being quite familiar with um, where they occur in southwest WA, the remnant populations, I felt like the Pilliga was going to be a really great new home for this species. Um, and they haven't proven me wrong. So they've, yeah, they've done amazing. They've They've um, hit the ground running really and pretty much um, doubled in population from their release in September um, 2022 to um, when we last monitored them in December 2023. So, oh. yeah. So doubled in population in just... Uh, just over a year, um, yeah. yeah. And I'll, sh I'll share a map of the fenced area here so that people have um, an understanding of the, the area that we're talking about here. How large is the fenced area and have all of the animals dispersed across across that whole range or are they still sort of spreading out? Yeah, they're still spreading out. So the whole fenced area is 5,800 hectares and you'll see on this map 
on that western side of the the fenced area there's a a breeding area um, with the yellow with the yellow diagonal lines on it. So a lot of our species were originally released into the breeding area. So bilbies, bridal nail tail wallabies, and that was specifically for, for genetic mixing of two populations of each of those species. Um, but we have subsequently also had to release brush tail betongs into that breeding area um, because of the presence of a fox in the, the wider fenced area. So yeah, there's an internal fence separating the breeding area to the wider fenced area. Um, and yeah, until late, well, late 2022, early 2023, we still had one existing, um, very elusive fox um, that was had all of that fenced area to itself. So it was um, pretty spoiled. Um, so was, yeah. Um, heard um, about the, the travails of our team trying to catch Rambo, the, the last fox to be removed from the pilliga. Um, now that he's been been removed, we've been able to release animals within the the whole fenced area. So it's from just that breeding area now into the the wider five thousand eight hundred hectares. That's right, and the, and so the bilbies have so the fence has completely been removed that internal fence, and um, bilbies have spread out right across to the other side now. Cameras and trapping is picking them up all over the place and the same with our brush tail betongs which I was quite surprised about that in that small space of time it was March last year that we opened up the fence that they have actually managed to move right over to the other side and using quite a di diversity of habitats now which is fantastic. Um, our bridal nail tail wallabies have, are a little bit slower to move out and I think they're quite settled in their habitat and their home ranges. And it's really just time as time goes by and, you know, juveniles are recruited into the population, they are slowly dispersing, but are much slower than than the other two. Yeah. There's another small mammal. This one's a, a marsupial that was also released in the last 18 months or so. Um, and this is an adorable bandicoot. It's called the Shark Bay Bandicoot, which seems like it's a long way away from the pilliga. Can you explain why this species is part of the reintroduction project in the Pilliga? Yes, the beautiful Shark Bay Bandicoot, um, also known as the Western Bar Bandicoot, which is what we're choosing to call it. Um, so, yes, it has come a long way. As its name suggests, it is from Shark Bay. Um, and this is quite an interesting species in that um, yeah, barred bandicoots once occurred across the whole of Australia, right from sort of Carnarvon in Western Australia, right across the southern parts of Australia into northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, we have a very high extin extinction rate of these, yeah, this complex of barred bandicoots. And unfortunately, we have no ma mainland species um, still surviving. We only have the Shark Bay bandicoot, which is a remnant with, where remnant populations are on Shark Bay Islands off the coast of Shark Bay on Bernier and Dore Islands. Um, so, and unfortunately, we've lost the mainland species and don't, yeah, the taxonomy is still unresolved. Um, but essentially, the, the latest thinking is that the shark bay bandicoot was a distinct species from barred bandicoots that occurred on the mainland. So, in effect, we've sort of done an introduction rather than a, a reintroduction. But unfortunately, we don't have any other species, you know, to return to the pilliga. And, you know, it's very, it's it's wonderful to have a bandicoot species back in the pilliga. And this is the closest living relative to what was once in the pilliga. Mm. Yeah, I think if you take an ecological perspective, the forest has evolved with a bandicoot, a small bandicoot, That's very right. similar to this one, performing those roles of, you know, digging for grubs and tubers, turning the soil over, and, you know, in those food web relationships with predators as well. So, it, you know, there's definitely space for a bandicoot in the pilliga. This one might be slightly different to the one that was there historically, but um, as you say, better to have a, a bandicoot as part of that system than not. And so that must have been quite an interesting translocation too. I've got a, a clip of one of the releases here. Can you tell us a bit more about how that translocation went and how that species is faring? Yeah, so that was a that was similar to the brush tail betong. It was a really big translocation. Well, it was probably even bigger because we sourced um, these animals from Dirk Hartog Island um, off the coast of Shark Bay, as well as from um, Mount Gibson, one of AWC sanctuaries. 
Um, so yeah, it was a very logistically large translocation to undertake getting animals, you know, trapping animals on the island, getting them off the island onto then onto a charter plane over to New South Wales. So um, so a lot of thought had to go into, you know, the welfare of these animals and making sure that, you know, we did everything um, possible to to get them here all healthy and safe and sound, um, which I can gladly say that we did. Um, and, yeah, they are doing really, really well. So we put a lot of work, similar to Plains Mice, we put a lot of work into identifying release sites for this species. We've been told by WA researchers that, you know, where you release them, you want to release suitable habitat because they don't tend to move very much. And this is, and that's exactly what happened with with our little bandicoots. That, um, you know, we they didn't they haven't moved very much, and um, so we um, put a lot of effort into making sure that we release them into suitable habitat. Um, so we used what we knew about the habitats that they were using on Dirk Hartog Island and Mount Gibson to choose our release sites in our shrubland, our low, low sort of shrubby areas and with, you know, sandy soils that they can dig in. Um, and, yeah, they're doing really, really well in that habitat. So um, we also, you know, made sure that we released our our females from Dirk Hartog with males from, from um, Mount Gibson, which is a, an approach we do to mix population, mix um, source sites, animals from source sites. So, yeah, but really um, positive signs, early signs. They were released in September last year. We trapped in January and... Um, we trapped 35 of our 66 animals released, which, you know, is a good starting number to, to re-trap. Um, and all the females were in breeding condition, um, which is fantastic news. Um, they were all within healthy weight ranges, which is another of our success criteria. Um, and, yeah, most of the females had twins, had two pouch young. So, yeah, they've they've done really well. They've, they're obviously finding sufficient food to maintain their body condition and their body weights and, and to breed so quickly. So um, it's very, very exciting. We didn't bring any pouch young with us at Dirk Hartog Island where we got most of the animals. They weren't breeding at all. The conditions were quite dry. Um, so the fact that we've got them here they've settled and they've started breeding so quickly is such a positive, yeah, outcome and such a quick response. So we're, mm -hmm. we're feeling pretty excited and, and yeah, happy about having the Western Bar Bandicoots in the Pelaga. How great. It, it's wonderful to hear about these three reintroductions that have happened, you know, over the, the last year and a half or so. Um, and of course, bilbies and bridled nail tail wallabies that you mentioned as well were introduced earlier on. Just looking back at the the partnership project so far, it's been eight years and it sounds like the forest is filling back up again with these small and medium-sized mammals. How would you reflect on the progress to date? Yeah, I think the progress um, has been great. And um, we've obviously had some challenges in there with some drought years early on, not long after, you know, bilbies and nail tails had gone in. Um, and then, you know, conditions improved, but then we went into floods. Um, so we've had some, and then obviously Rambo, the fox taking so long to, to remove. And um, it's been a fantastic partnership. Um, I think, you know, this type of partnership is really a great example of how critical and important it is, you know, for organisations, you know, in both, you know, government and not-for-profit to be working together, um, you know, yeah, because it's that sort of combined effort and, you know, pooling our knowledge and our experiences together that really helps with the success of these types of projects. And um, it's just really wonderful to see that, you know, you're getting these regionally extinct species that are not anywhere else in New South Wales, getting them back into New South Wales and interstate conservation areas and national parks, um, you know, which are, are landscapes that are going to be protected in perpetuity. So, um it's yeah from my perspective it's been a fantastic partnership um and i think the project has yeah is full of great stories a few challenges but they're challenges that national parks and awc have worked through together um to come out the other end still smiling and still working hard and still turning up every day to yeah to ensure the success of the project so yeah it's a, a tribute to the work of you and your team that it's been so successful to date and we had a few people asking that, yes, five species have been released so far, but there were six on the list initially. What is the final species proposed for reintroduction under the partnership? And when might we see 
that reintroduction go ahead? Yeah, so the final species is the western quoll, also known as chudich, um, which is a quoll species that occurred, you know, right across from WA where it is, it still occurs, um, right across to the west, yeah, the western side of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales. So um, that is a species that um, we won't reintroduce until our other species have established. So obviously we've still you know, brush-tailed betong and um, particularly the, the Western Bar Bandicoot are only new to the Pilliga, so we really need to have those populations um, established before we introduce, reintroduce a predator, a native predator. So um, Western quoll will be a predator of of um, definitely bandicoots and, and betongs, particularly young betongs and young bilbies. So we definitely want to make sure those populations are established before the, that species comes in. So um, it won't be probably in the time frame of our current 10-year contract with the New South Wales government, um, which ends in early 2026, um, but hopefully very soon afterwards. So, Vicky, it's a terrific project underway in the Pilliga. Thank you so much for sharing progress to date, and we look forward to hearing more about it. My pleasure, Joey. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. for, um, yeah.